Sports Talk Chicago. Here with John Zaglorl, and we are back and ready for today's special guest. He's a Bulls insider at Stadium Sport Reporter at ABC7 and the host of the Give Me the Hot Sauce podcast with Stacey King. Please welcome Mark Janowski to the program. Mark, it's great to have you on. How are you? John, thanks for having me. Doing well. What do you make of last night's game for the Bulls, first off? Well, it's two ways of looking at it. The glass half full approach is that they played fantastic defense. They had a great chance to win in the second half and they can build on this and maybe get a win in game two on Wednesday. The uh, negative aspect is they had a perfect chance to steal that game. Milwaukee did not shoot the ball from well from three point range and they let it slip away. So I'm sure that Billy Donovan and his coaches, when they go over the tape, they're going to emphasize all the things they did well defensively. You're not going to get that poor of a shooting night, I don't think, from DeMar DeRozan again in the series. So if DeMar just has a normal game, they win that opening game. And I think that they showed the Bucks that they're just not going to roll over in the series. And if Milwaukee wants to advance, they're going to have to earn it. What contributed to that poor shooting night for the Bulls all around? I think it was just a little bit of rust, a little bit of playoff jitters. And let's remember Milwaukee is playing defense too. So it wasn't like they were getting all uncontested shots. DeRozan was challenged on a lot of his mid-range attempts. He did get some clean looks throughout the game, but I think that their defense, the Bucks' defense, is predicated on let's not let DeRozan get off. I was thinking that Zach Levine would probably be as healthy as going to as he's going to be in this series for game one. Yeah, everyone knows about the knee issue that's been troubling him over the last six weeks or so. And I figured with a week off and a chance to get some th- some treatment during that practice week, he would come out strong. But unfortunately, Zach didn't shoot it well either. You know, when your two best guys aren't hitting their outside shots, it makes it tougher on everybody else to try to pick up the slack. It was one of those old-fashioned grind him out playoff games, and, and the Bulls had a really good chance to win. Unfortunately, they just couldn't buy a bucket in the final two minutes. Were you expecting that sort of shooting performance overall? I mean, they were horrible from three-point range, and even inside the three-point line, they weren't doing that well. Were you expecting that kind of performance? I thought that the Bulls would really come out shooting the ball well. I think with the week of practice and really having a good game plan going in, that they would get some good, clean looks for their players. You know, you look at at some of the point-blank layups that Nikola Vucevic missed inside. It was just one of those days where – they had an opportunity to, to steal that game, and they just couldn't get anything to fall. There was that sequence late in the game where Vucevic missed two point-blank shots. And what are you going to do when your 6'11 center misses from that, that close in? It just uh, just wasn't meant to be. You know, I'm sure the Bucks are feeling really good that they were able to play far less than their optimal standard and still escape with a victory in game one. And now they'll look at the tape, and they'll come in, I think, much more motivated, much more focused in game two. So – the Bulls will not only have to shoot better, I think they'll have to play better all around to have a chance to steal one on Wednesday night. Do you think they shifted momentum in any way, knowing that the Bucs also didn't shoot well, they ended up pulling this one out? I think they built some confidence within their own group. I think now they feel like this team is not clearly better than us. We can compete with them. Remember, during the regular season series, the Bulls had a really good chance to win the first two games they played against the Bucs and, and lost those leads late. Uh, They kind of got blown out in the second two games in the regular season. But I think now they feel like they've got a game plan for how to defend this Bucs team. I thought Alex Caruso did a fantastic job on Chris Middleton. Chris Middleton shot poorly. That's because of the pressure that Caruso put on him. I think he was like four for 11. He had had 11 points in the game, and he was really a non-factor. I thought, you know, you take one of Milwaukee stars out of the equation. And Drew Holiday didn't really shoot well until late in the game as well. So I I feel like they, they did pretty much what they wanted to do defensively. They were able to get Giannis in some foul trouble. He had some pretty good numbers overall, but he didn't take over the game as he's done in a lot of the previous meetings between the Bulls and Bucks. So I think that defensively, they found some answers that they can use the rest of the series. The question is, can they knock down shots if, in close games in the fourth quarter? Mark Janowski here on Sports Talk Chicago. Mark, what's the game plan exactly defensively? How the Bulls do so well last night in guarding uh, Giannis and Chris Middleton? I think what they're trying to do is to make sure that uh, they get up on them physically. I thought Caruso did a good job of getting into Chris Middleton's body, really affecting his dribble. Middleton, as good of a shooter he is, sometimes can be a little bit careless with his handle. He tries to cross over in front of his body, and a lot of times that ball is right there for the picking. I believe Milwaukee had 19 turnovers in the game, and they, they were a little bit sloppy with their ball handling. And I think some of that was a lot of that was due to the Bulls' pressure. They also did a, did a pretty good job on Giannis after the first quarter. You know, the first quarter did not go well for the Bulls at all. Milwaukee was up 34-21, and, and they were really getting to the rim pretty easily with Giannis and Brooke Lopez. I think over the last three quarters, they did a better job of trying to put pressure on Giannis, force him to be a jump shooter, 
And when you can do that, he's not going to be quite as effective. So the defensive game plan was sound. I thought they got some good shots offensively. They just had a bad shooting night. The hope is that uh, that changes on Wednesday, gives them a chance to get over the top in the series. How sustainable do you think this defensive effort will be? I think it is. You know, defense is always about effort and uh, getting a total team commitment. You know, having one guy make the correct rotation when there's a screen set or somebody loses their man, the next guy slides over. And I thought defensively, they were pretty sound. As I mentioned early in the game, they lost Brook Lopez a couple of times. He got some layups where he was switched on to smaller players, but they, they kind of cleaned that up over the final three quarters. Lopez had the, uh, the two and ones late in the game, which really hurt them. Both of them, he kind of got hit on the arms and just flung the ball up towards the basket. He was lucky that those went in. Of course, there's always an element of luck in any sport, and uh, the Bucks did get the luck down the stretch, and the Bulls, as I mentioned, couldn't buy a basket. What's the Bulls' biggest threat moving forward in this series? I think that uh, the thing that they can do against the Bucks is they have multiple ways that they can attack them offensively. You know, with Vucevic not shooting it well from three, he was two for 10 from three. Zach was two for 10 from three. They've got to knock down some of those three-point shots. I think that they do have the personnel to challenge this Milwaukee team. Milwaukee is the worst team in the league in defending the three-point line. And I think that was the strategy that they had going in is uh, – drive in, penetrate, kick it out to our three-point shooters, and we're going to get wide-open looks. I'm sure Billy Donovan and his staff, when they look at the tape, are going, man, we got so many clean looks from the three-point line. You know, Kobe White did a couple of shots when they had that third-quarter run that really helped them. But their mainstays, Booch and Zach Levine, in terms of three-point shooting, were four for 20. That's got to change on Wednesday night and throughout the series. What's your take on the rest of this series? Do the Bulls even have a chance to come back and win it, or how do you see the rest of it going? Well, it's going to be tough. You know, the Bucks are the defending world champions, and, and they got there for, for a reason. They have excellent personnel. They're really tough to stop, and I, and I thought the Bulls played as well as they could defensively in game one. I think they'll get a game in this series. I, I don't know which one it'll be, maybe game three when they go back to Chicago and they get the home crowd on their side for the game on Friday night. But they're, they're up against a team that has a, is playoff tested, has some of the best clutch performers in the league. Uh, winning the series... I, I don't think that that's a very likely outcome in, in, in this series, but I think that they've shown Milwaukee that they're not going anywhere. They're going to battle. They're going to make the Bucks earn a victory in the first round, and I think that we're going to see a lot of close games uh, throughout the rest of the series. Do you think the Bulls, if they play them close like they did yesterday, you'd consider this series somewhat of a success knowing how close they played it? Well, then you have to go back over the way the season really developed. You know, back at the All-Star break, which wasn't all that long ago, they were tied with Miami for the best record in the league. And at that point, the hope was that they could finish strong, maintain a top four seed, get home court advantage in the first round, and maybe get a more favorable playoff matchup. Instead, as we know, they had some problems with injuries, guys out, and not playing as well as they did the first half of the season. They sunk all the way to six, and they did not get a favorable matchup. The Bucs tanked their last game because they wanted the Bulls in the first round. They wanted that 3-6 matchup, and now you know they're trying to take full advantage of it. I think when uh, the script is written for this season, people will look back at the last 25 games and go, man, if they only could have played better over the final six weeks of the season, they maybe could have gotten a more favorable playoff matchup, maybe uh, drew Toronto in the first round and had a chance to advance. What do you say about this season yourself? Is this a success, or how do you define it based on what happened later in the year? I think the season overall has been a tremendous success. When you look back at the fact they won 31 games last year, albeit in a shortened 72-game season, but you know they climbed all the way to 46 wins. They identified some things that they could do on both sides of the court. They added real impact players in DeMar DeRozan and Lonzo Ball and Alex Caruso. And I think those guys will really help them going forward. You know, we haven't even talked about Lonzo Ball yet, and his absence has been felt throughout these last couple of months. You know, the things that he can do on the defensive end in terms of on-ball pressure, his passing ability, and his three-point shooting. Remember, Lonzo shot 42%, averaging seven three-point attempts per game during the season. You put Lonzo Ball out on the court with those open three-point looks, maybe the Bulls win game one. And I think you get a healthy Lonzo Ball back for the start of training camp, you build off what you did this season, maybe tweak the roster a little bit to add one more athletic big to complement Nikola Vucevic and Patrick Williams. And then I think you have a chance to compete for a top four spot and home court advantage next season.
what's their biggest need for next year? Big guy is what you just said. Is that what they should be looking for? Absolutely. You know, they have the 19th pick in the draft, and I, and I believe that they're going to go for either an athletic backup center or a power forward who can really stretch the floor, who can shoot the three-point ball, and also can protect the rim. Uh, they also are going to have a mid-level exception that they can use in free agency. And don't be surprised if uh, AK decides to make a trade or two to solidify that front line. When you look at the way they played throughout the season, they've because of injuries, COVID, personnel issues, they've been forced to go small for most of the season. You know, I know Billy Donovan did that a lot in Oklahoma City, and he's comfortable going with multiple guards on the court. But against some teams, when you're going with Nikola Vucevic surrounded by four guards, you're going to get hurt on the boards. You're going to get hurt defensively inside. And I think that when AK looks back on the season and ways he can solidify the roster, he's going to get uh, Billy a backup center that, that he can have confidence in, that can protect the rim, as I mentioned, can block some shots. And he's going to find another power forward who can shoot threes, space the floor, and allow Zach and uh, DeMar to have more operating room on their drives to the basket. Is there anybody specific you're thinking of? There's a kid from Duke I really like, Mark Williams. Their center really came out strong. The problem is he played so well late in the year and in the NCAA tournament, he's now projected as a late lottery pick. Couldn't rule out the possibility you could trade up, but the Bulls have so little draft capital. And trading up is not as common in the NBA as it is in the NFL. So I don't know if they can get up high enough to get Mark Williams. He's a 6'10 shot blocker. He can jump out of the gym. I think that he would be a perfect addition to this team. Um, you know, I th there's a, a number of power forwards out there that they can look at that maybe can be a compliment to Patrick Williams, kind of give him a one-two punch at that spot. But, you know, when you draft lower in the draft at 19, you're not going to get, most likely you're not going to get an impact player. But remember, uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo and, and Kawhi Leonard were picked around 15, 16. So sometimes you do get lucky in the middle of the draft. What about Zach Levine's contract situation? Where do you see that ending up this offseason? I think they'll re-sign him to a max deal, and I don't think there's going to be a lot of haggling about it. I think last season during the summer when he was eligible for an extension, Arturis Karnischewicz told him, just be patient. We want to improve the roster around you, and in order to do that, we're going to have to delay giving you a big contract until next summer. I'm not saying that they made a firm verbal promise that we're going to max you, but you know, Zach made the all-star team for the second straight year before he had the knee injury. He was playing some of the best basketball of his career with career highs and assists. Also, his shooting was good at all three levels, and, and I felt like he had taken another step in his career. He also had improved somewhat defensively. So I think Zach will get that max deal with the understanding that nothing is permanent. We've seen that around the NBA so often that, you know, Zach will be brought back in all likelihood. But if AK has presented a deal, whether it's a sign and trade this summer or somewhere down the road where he needs Zach's salary slot to make it happen, I don't think they're going to promise Zach that you're going to be a bull for life. I think they'll give him the money and they'll bring him back. But I, I think that this roster will continue to be fluid until they get to the point where they feel like that they can not only contend for home court advantage in the first round, but maybe make a run at getting to the finals and winning a championship. I think that's why our tourist was brought in. That's his mission statement. And we've seen that he's not afraid to make bold moves. And, and I think that I think anyone is, is possible to be included in a trade if that can make the Bulls a better team. How likely do you think that is right now? I don't think that they're, they would trade Zach this summer. You know, there's been some speculation that the Lakers might be looking to make major changes, possibly even including making Chicago native Anthony Davis available in trade. And, you know, there, there could be a scenario where there's a discussion. Would you si sign and trade Zach Levine for Anthony Davis? That's a tough one. You know, obviously, Zach is 27. He's younger than Anthony, but the Bulls need a big man. Uh, you know, the salaries would probably be close to matching. I don't know if the Lakers or the Bulls would be interested in doing a one-for-one -one deal, but those are the kind of things that may present themselves as we go down the line. Another situation to watch is what happens with Zion Williamson in New Orleans. You know, he's, he's close to being ready to get back to the court, according to the reports out of New Orleans. But at, at the weight he's been playing at, and the issues he's been having both with his knee and with his foot, the foot injury caused him to miss the entire season, he may, either the Pelicans management or Zion may try to force his way out of there, and he may become available. Do you, do you pursue something like that down the road? So guys do become available. It didn't used to be that way in the NBA, but now you see every summer, you know, two or three stars either want to change teams on their own or teams are looking to get off contracts. And I know that this front office uh, tandem 
will be very proactive in trying to find a possible trade that can get the Bulls over the top. What's the Bulls championship window look like right now, and how could that improve based on potential trades coming up this offseason? Well, you have to look at the fact that DeMar DeRozan will be 33 next season. He's, he's coming off a career year. I mean, it's pretty unusual for a guy in his 13th NBA season to put up the kind of numbers DeMar has, you know, averaging a career high in points, shooting it at a high percentage from the field and also a career high from the three-point line and putting up, you know, over five assists and five rebounds a game. He has been a godsend for the Bulls. His performance in the fourth quarter has been as good as anyone in the league. And if you're AK and Mark Eversley and you're looking realistically at, at trying to project the next season, I don't think you can automatically project those same numbers for DeMar next season. I think you have to look at the fact that, you know, he may not be quite as uh, prolific as he was this year, and you have to improve the pieces around him. I think that they'll be looking to add one more guy who can create the, his shot, as well as, as I mentioned, strengthening their, their inside presence. I know that they don't feel like this is a finished product, and they'll, they'll look for improvement internally from guys like Patrick Williams and Kobe White, but they'll also be looking to strengthen the team from the outside. Are you at all concerned about the fact that Levine maybe gets a new contract, but DeRozan has two more years left and Vucevic has one more? Could that be a problem for the Bulls when it comes to winning something significant in the future? Well, you were talking about a championship window, and with this group, that is your championship window. It's the next couple of years with DeMar under contract. What they'll do with uh, Nikola Vucevic is going to be fascinating because, as you mentioned, one more year on that contract, and his salary number actually goes down for next season. So he could be an attractive piece for a contender that's maybe looking for a big man who could shoot from the outside that they feel like it could possibly put them over the top. The name Rudy Gobert has come up because of the fact that uh, the Jazz kind of underachieved this year. I think they're going to win that first round series with Dallas because Luka Doncic is hurt right now. But if they don't advance beyond the second round in the Western Conference playoffs, you know, they have Danny Ainge came in as a consultant and Dwayne Wade is part of ownership now. They may look to blow up that team around Donovan Mitchell. The problem with Rudy Gobert, yeah, he'd be nice for the Bulls in terms of his defensive presence and the fact that he's a multiple-time All-Star. But his salary, he, he was signed to a max deal recently. His salary numbers are crazy, and I don't think I would pay that much for a guy that doesn't give you that much on the offensive end. Mark Janowski still here on Sports Talk Chicago. Mark, a few more questions before we finish up. First off, give me the hot sauce. How's it been going? It's been going great. We've, we have a lot of fun. You know, Stacy uh, is a bundle of energy and he brings great <laughs> stories every week. You know, he's been busy traveling. The Bulls had a ton of road games over the final month of the season, but, but Stacy always wants to do the show. You know, I always tell him, Stacy, we can take a week off if you want. He goes, no, I want to make sure we get a new show out every week. And he really, he really cares a lot about the project. You know, he wants to make sure we're getting good guests for our listeners. You know, we had two guests last week. We had Devon Dotson on, you know, the former Bull, the Kansas All-American. Remember that scene at the national championship where Bill Self uh, walked by and gave him his national championship hat? Uh, Dotson tells that story about, uh, you know, the fact that he was overwhelmed with emotion because his 2020 team was considered the favorite going in the NCAA tournament. And that's when COVID wiped out the entire NCAA dance. And uh, he was there with some of his teammates from that squad. And, and Bill Self, af right after winning the national title, made sure to honor that group because he felt they could have won it. And we also had Ali Quigley on the show, you know, one of the best shooters in the WNBA. They just started training camp to defend their championship. And she talked about some of the challenges and growing up in Joliet and playing at Joliet Catholic in DePaul. So if people get a chance, uh, go back and check out episode 74, Give Me the Hot Sauce, a couple of great interviews. And uh, I know Stacy's trying to get Jay Billis on this week. So uh, we'll see if uh, we can deliver on that as well. Mark, before we finish up today, last question. What's your favorite Bulls playoff memory? Uh, for me, it, it has to be the Phoenix series, 1993. That was an all-out war. That was Charles Barkley at the height of his powers when he won the NBA title. And I had the good fortune of uh, being in Phoenix to uh, work as a reporter for Channel 7 uh, during that series. And, you know, it was a weird series because, remember, the Bulls won the first two games. Well, you don't remember. You weren't even born yet. <laughs> uh, but but you, know, you know the history. Yes. Um, you know the history that the Bulls went into Phoenix and won the first two games, and they had a stranglehold on the series. And with the 2-3-2 two, two format at that point, everyone thought it was going to be a cakewalk. They'd win two of the next three in Chicago, and they'd be celebrating a championship. Well, Phoenix won a triple overtime game in game three with uh, Barkley scoring close to 50. I think Jordan had like 56. And that kind of made it a competitive series again. The Bulls won game four, and then 
I remember the uh, the mayor putting out public service uh, announcements to say, protect our town, celebrate safely. And Charles Barkley and his group saw that, and they made a big deal of saying, there ain't going to be no celebration in Chicago after game five. And when they, when they won game five at the uh, United Center, they made a big deal. Oh, excuse me, that was the old, uh, the old stadium. They made a big deal of, um, you know, saying that I guess that Chicago is going to be safe tonight. You got nothing to celebrate. <laughs> so they go back, they go back to Phoenix and, you know, the, the Bulls, there was a legitimate concern that the Phoenix, of course, had the best record that year. They had Charles Barkley. They had Kevin Johnson, who was a fantastic point guard at the time. They had Dan Marley. They had some other uh, good scores on the team. There was some real concern that, that, you know, it'd be tough to get a couple of wins or get that one, one win they needed in Phoenix. Well, you know how the history went. Phoenix had the lead, but the Bulls, uh, were able to get the ball to John Paxson, John Paxson making that huge shot to put them ahead. And then Horace Grant blocked Kevin Johnson shot on the other end and the bulls were walking off with their third championship. So, you know, being in the building and seeing how that game unfolded, uh, that, that was probably my favorite in-person memory. And then of course, Jordan's last shot in Utah is right there as well. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining me. Always a pleasure to have you on to talk Bulls. Best wishes with Give Me the Hot Sauce and covering the rest of this series. Hopefully things work out for the Bulls. Thank you so much. Thanks, John. Enjoyed it as always. 